I don't know about you, but I, it's always better when the sound system is on. <laughs> Especially a, a day like today. I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize for my voice. It's actually gotten a lot better. Um, it it uh, sounds worse than it is. Uh, what, on Thursday, when I was really bad, I, I, had, I had the school mass, and the, uh, I started to chant a little bit. And uh, boy, it really gave the kids something to laugh about. So. So we just heard in the first reading the sacrifice of Abraham. This is a watershed moment, a pivotal moment of salvation history. And, and we, we heard the passages from it, but there's a section of it that's important that we didn't hear that's part of the account. Now remember this is happening about 1800 years before the coming of Christ. And, and Abraham has been promised an heir, He's, the Lord's delivered on that, and Isaac. And at this time, Isaac, we usually think of Isaac as about, you know, a, a little boy, but he's actually, scholars would say, he's somewhere between 18 and 25 years old. He's in the prime of his life. And it's here that the Lord asks him, asks Abraham to sacrifice the promise, what is most dear to him. And, and Abraham obeys. He believes that God can still deliver his promise. That's why we call Abraham our father in faith. And, and as, as they're going to, for, to this sacrifice, you can have Isaac carrying the wood of the sacrifice, right? This great prefigurement of the Messiah. And Isaac asks Abraham, he says, well, we have, the, we have the wood, the knife, and the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says prophetically, God himself will provide the sacrifice. And we see this happening in that when Abraham is ready to offer this, his son up in sacrifice, the Lord, set, Lord restrains him. Right? And, then, and then Abraham sees the ram in the thicket where the, where the ram becomes the substitute for, for, the, for the son. God didn't have Abraham sacrifice his son because the father is going to sacrifice his son for us. God will provide this sacrifice. And he does. But why do we need a sacrifice? Because the world is in disorder. Our lives are in disorder for one reason. Sin. Sin scatters, it wounds, it divides. Love binds and heals and creates communion and unity. And we hunger for that communion of love, we're made for that communion of love. And sin disrupts it, destroys it. We need the forgiveness of sin. And only God can forgive sin, and he does. In fact, he delights in it. And no matter what the cost, he's willing to pay it for us. He himself becomes the sacrifice for us dying as man to expiate man's sin, sins of the whole world, your sins, my sins. And today, Jesus' human nature is transfigured, showing Peter, James, and John, and us that he is God in the flesh. And his human nature will, right now is being irradiated by his divinity and his human nature will again be transfigured again horribly in his passion and death when he becomes the sacrificial lamb for us, expiating, atoning for our sins. He who did not know sin was made sin so that we could become the righteousness of God, making it possible for his mercy to reach us in our human nature. And that's what Elijah and Moses are talking to Jesus about in the Transfiguration. We don't hear it here in St. Mark, but in, in St. Luke we, hear, we get the details. They're talking about the exodus that he was to undergo in Jerusalem. That is his passion and death and resurrection. The exodus from sin. And so forgiveness of sins is what the Christian life is all about. 
And how does God's forgiveness get into us? How do we enter into his mercy? Confession. This is one of our parish focuses this Lent, that confession becomes a regular and frequent part of our Christian walk. Jesus did something so that we could enter into his mercy. He made a way for us. The sacrament of confession is also called the sacrament of reconciliation, of penance, of conversion, of forgiveness, because it has all these effects. And Jesus himself established confession as the way to forgive sin. He does this in the Bible. If you remember when he gives Peter the keys, of the kingdom, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you hold bound are held bound. When he breathes the Holy Spirit after the resurrection upon the apostles at the end of the Gospel of John, receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. St. James in his letter tells the Christian community, declare your sins to one another. And so Jesus instituted a sacrament of forgiveness that he entrusted to his apostles. And you know, the sacrament is not something that I can do by myself. Right? Telling the Lord I'm sorry as soon as I sin is good. But we need to restore that communion. And a sacrament necessarily brings me into a relationship, into a communion. Confession reestablishes us in the state of grace, of being in communion with God, which we received in the, when we were first baptized. And that is why there's a deep connection between the sacrament of confession and the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Because only in the state of grace are we able to receive Jesus' body and blood in Holy Communion. And so when I commit grave sin, Things like deliberately skipping Mass on Sundays or Holy Days, sexual sins, serious theft, lying, etc. I cut myself off from the life of grace. I cut off my relationship with God. And, we, and I need to be restored to that state of grace before I'm going back to Holy Communion. And confession does this. The Catechism says something very beautiful about it. Listen to this. Christ instituted the sacrament of penance for all sinful members of his church, above all for those who since baptism have fallen into grave sin and have thus lost their baptismal grace and wounded ecclesial communion. It is to them that the sacrament of penance offers a new possibility to convert and to recover the grace of justification. And the Lord through his church offers this again and again and again, and again. It's shame that holds us bound. That's one of the tricks of the enemy to keep us from this sacrament. And what can help in that is, is knowing that the priest is bound by the seal of confession. That what is said in confession to a priest, he can never reveal. And priests have gone to prison, and they have died upholding that seal. And what does that do? That gives us the place of freedom to say what we need to say. This is why we should never hide sins in confession. It makes our situation somewhat worse by doing that. And you know, and sometimes we get ourselves into a sinful situation, we don't know how to get out of it. And there can be the temptation just to sit in the imprisonment and the slavery and the misery that it brings. Or to s deceive ourselves that our situation is otherwise than it is. The first step in, the, in, the, in that sort of situation to get free is to come to confession. We can declare before God, Lord, I don't know how to get out of this. Because not only in, conf in confession, not only is sin forgiven, 
But grace is given precisely in those areas of the heart that are weak to a particular sin that we're confessing. And it's in confession that habits of sin are broken down over time. So I, sometimes we, we have to go to confession often for a particular habit of sin, and that's okay. St. Thomas Aquinas says, in the life of the body, a man is sometimes sick, and unless he takes medicine, he will die. Even so, in the spiritual life, a man is sick on account of sin. For that reason, he needs medicine so that he may be restored to health. And this grace is bestowed in the sacrament of penance. Hearing confessions is one of the great blessings of being a priest. You know, and people are reconciling. Father, it's been two years. It's been five years. It's been 25 years. Father, I don't know the last time I went to confession. And you know what I always say when I hear that? First thing to say, welcome back. You belong here. You belong with us. I was talking to our children who are preparing for their first Holy Communion about their first confession. They've already started to go to confession, which is a great preparation for receiving our Lord. You know what they said? Gosh, it, it didn't take as long as I thought. Or, I feel so light. That's true. We carry around our sins far too long. It weighs us down. And it may help to know, too, that as priests, we are also penitents. I go to confession at least every month. I try to go every two weeks. Because the more we go, the better we get at it, and the easier it becomes. And so if it's been a while... Just come. It won't be as difficult or as long as you think. The enemy wants to keep you bound in sin and in shame. So don't fall for his tricks of discouragement and hopelessness. Jesus always provides a way, and he's made it so easy to reconcile with him. He has already paid for every sin. That is why he delights when we ask for forgiveness, because it means his cross was not in vain. St. John Paul II said, confession is an act of honesty and courage, an act of entrusting ourselves beyond sin to the mercy of a loving and forgiving God. And so we have confessions here on Tuesday evenings before Mass from 5 to 5.45. During Lent, we're having it on Thursdays from 6 to 7.30 p.m. We had our first session this last Thursday. I didn't have a single break. It was great. And on Saturdays from 3.30 to 5. Remember, God himself will provide the sacrifice. He has done so through his cross. And reconciliation comes through his sacrament of confession. Today, his human nature is transfigured by his divinity. Today, he wants to do something similar in us. He wants to transfigure us through confession so that our lives may radiate the divine life.